Okay, you're all set, Stephanie. Wonderful, thank you so much. So like Lisa said, my name is Stephanie. I am the Whooping Crane Outreach Coordinator at the International Crane Foundation. And I'm really excited to be here today to talk about the cranes that we have here in Illinois. So uh, Lisa kind of teed it up very well there, but I'll be talking about how to identify these cranes. I'll be discussing their history, the spaces that you can find cranes throughout the year, some of those human wildlife interactions that we're seeing with cranes, as well as the conservation work that the International Crane Foundation is involved in, in ways that you can get involved in some of that work as well. But before we dive into all of that, I do want to take a moment to introduce the International Crane Foundation and share with you our mission statement. So the International Crane Foundation, also called ICF, works worldwide to conserve cranes and the ecosystems, watersheds, and flyways on which they depend. And the International Crane Foundation is headquartered in Baraboo, Wisconsin, and is located within the ancestral homeland of the Ho-Chunk people. As an organization, we acknowledge and honor the Ho-Chunk people as caretakers of the land and water since time immemorial, and as our neighbors, friends, and vital members of our community. The International Crane Foundation is dedicated to amplifying local voice and perspective in all of the places where cranes dance. And pictured here, we have all 15 species of cranes that can be found around the world and at our headquarters in Baraboo, Wisconsin. And you can see by looking at these birds that there's a lot of diversity between them, but there's also a lot of shared features. So you can see they all appear to have very long beaks, small heads, and long necks. And with those lengthening features, you can probably gather that these birds are relatively tall as well. A lot of that height for our cranes is coming from these very long legs that are just out of the picture here. But the tallest of all 15 species of cranes that we work with is the Saurus crane. They're found in places like India and Australia, and they stand at six feet tall. And the shortest of all 15 species of cranes is going to be our Demoiselle crane. They stand at about two and a half to three feet tall. But despite being the shortest species of crane, they do have one of the most impressive migrations. They'll actually fly over the Himalayas on their migration, just a few thousand feet below that of a commercial airplane. So they are a pretty tough little bird. Like I said before, a lot of that hype for our cranes is coming from these incredibly long legs. And that's really advantageous for cranes to have these long legs because all 15 species are dependent on wetlands to some degree, some much more so than others, and some use them sort of intermittently. You can actually tell just how wetland dependent they are by looking at their beaks. Those that have the very long skinny beaks, cranes like our wattled crane, our saurus, our brolga, our Siberian and our whooping, these are some of the most wetland dependent species of cranes. They need that long skinny beak to be able to probe around in deep water or deep mud in order to find their food resources. But some of our cranes, like the blue crane or our crowned cranes or a demoiselle, you can see they have kind of a shorter, more rounded beak. And that's because seeds are going to be making up a larger part of their diet. And you might find them in wetlands or adjacent to wetlands and prairies or even sort of upland areas. But these cranes are incredibly impressive. They're found around the world. You can find them on five out of seven continents. The only spaces you won't find cranes is in South America and Antarctica. And here in North America, we're very lucky to have two species of cranes, both of which can be found in Illinois seasonally. And that's going to be our whooping crane and our sandhill crane. And we'll talk about both of those cranes today. But we'll start with the sandhill crane. I'd venture a bet that everybody here is a little bit familiar with the sandhill crane. Maybe you've seen them, maybe you've heard them, maybe you've heard of them. They're one of the most common species of cranes found around the world. There's about 800,000 of them across North America. And in the Eastern United States where we live, that population recently jumped up to 100,000 sandhill cranes. So they're much more common, we're much more likely to see them. On the very opposite end of the spectrum is one of the rarest, most endangered species of cranes, and that's going to be our whooping crane. So focusing on the Eastern United States, for the 100,000 sandhill cranes that can come through our area each year, we're looking at about 76 whooping cranes. So that's a very big difference in numbers right there. And our whooping cranes are listed as endangered. And unfortunately for cranes, being listed as threatened or even endangered like our whooping crane is not uncommon. 10 out of the 15 species of cranes that we work with around the world are listed as threatened or endangered. And that's really due to uh, various threats of poaching, habitat loss, diseases, the illegal pet trade, and many other factors. But today we're just going to focus on Illinois cranes again, the sandhill crane and the whooping crane. 
And before we dive into the history of these species, I do want to take a moment to familiarize you with these birds. My main goal being that you can comfortably and confidently identify whooping cranes and sandhill cranes by sight and maybe even by sound as well, especially as we are nearing fall migration and pretty soon the skies there in your area are going to be filled with the calls of cranes and hopefully you'll be able to spot some whooping cranes as they're flying over too. But let's start first with this sandhill crane. And before we talk about what they look like, I always like to start with what they sound like. The main you want to see this, Bruce? Yeah. The main reason being that their calls are incredibly loud. They can carry. Cranes. They're a very charismatic call. There's not really anything that sounds quite like them. And sometimes we even describe their call as being that of uh, something that you would expect maybe a dinosaur to make. It's a very loud rattle. Nothing else is going to make a sound quite like it. It almost makes you turn and look every time you hear it. So the first call that I'm going to play for the sandhill crane is called their guard call. This is one you're probably most familiar with because this is a call that they make on their migration and the call that you're gonna be hearing as they're flying overhead. And the next call that we have is a unison call. So this can be made year round, but it's most frequently made during the breeding season. And this is really important, especially for your area because while we might not see too many sandhill cranes breeding in your area right now, we are seeing that their breeding range is continuing to push further south. So you can in the coming years expect to see more breeding sandhill cranes and hopefully more frequently hear this unison call. And the unison call is a really interesting call because you're gonna be hearing two birds calling at the same time. They're a bonded pair and they're typically doing this to sort of defend their territory or to help establish or strengthen that pair bond that they're having on their breeding territory. And I'll play that call for you now. So our sandhill cranes, they also have some very charismatic physical features about them as well. First thing being, they're very tall, they're a crane. They stand at about four feet tall. And a lot of that height again is coming from those long black legs and that long outstretched neck. You'll see on the top of their head, they have a featherless red patch on the crown. If you noticed earlier on all of those pictures of the cranes, there's a lot of repetition of that color red. And an interesting fact about that red color is that that is not feathers, that's all exposed skin. And when cranes are feeling threatened or territorial or upset, they can push blood into those areas and cause that red to expand across the top of their head. Our sandhill crane is also going to have sort of an orangish amber eye, a long sharp black beak, and then throughout their entire body and wings, it's gonna be sort of a slate gray color or a reddish brown. So oftentimes here in the Midwest, we get asked, well, what about the gray sandhill cranes? What about the red sandhill cranes? Am I seeing two different species? Am I seeing males and females? What's really going on there? And the answer is a little bit stranger than you might think. So pictured here, I have on top those red sandhill cranes and on the bottom I have those gray sandhill cranes. And then here I have a close up of their feathers. So when sandhill cranes reach their breeding age and they're returning back to their breeding territories, they're gonna be coming back as early as late February, sometimes even early March. And during that time, they'll be returning to wetlands that aren't really that sort of green color that we're used to seeing wetlands, but they're returning to wetlands that are sort of a dead vegetation brown color. And sandhill cranes, once they get to those spaces, they're immediately going to start finding an area to nest, building a nest, breeding, laying eggs, everything that they need to do to get chicks on the ground as soon as possible. And in order to increase their chance of survival during that time, they need to find a way to camouflage in with this environment. So sandhill cranes will actually take mud from wetlands and they'll wipe it all around their body. That mud is very rich in iron, so it oxidizes or kind of turns those feathers this rusty color. And once they reach breeding age, they're kind of always going to have rusty feathers because sandhill cranes never do a complete molt. They never drop all of their feathers at once like some water birds do. So they're always going to have sort of this mix of reddish brown or slate gray feathers once they reach that breeding age. The next crane that we have here in Illinois is our whooping crane. And I'll start again first with what they sound like. They have a very loud call, it's very charismatic, so much so that their name, the whooping crane, actually comes from that call. The call has sort of a whooping-like characteristic to it. There's no rattle, it's a very crisp sound, and it sounds almost like a shout. So I'm gonna play this guard call where you're gonna hear one bird calling and one immediately responding to them. 
And the next call that we have is that unison call. So again, they can make it year round. It's really going to ramp up during the breeding season, but you'll hear two birds calling at the same time. So hopefully you notice how that one does sound quite different than the sandhill crane. It's much more crisp, kind of clear, and sort of a bit of a, uh, a shout rather than a, uh, a trumpeting sort of noise. So then looking at our whooping cranes, they also have some very charismatic features about them. They're taller and heavier bodied than our sandhill cranes. Our whooping cranes stand at five feet tall, making them the tallest bird in all of North America. You can see they also have these long black legs, this brilliant white body coming up through a long neck. They have a featherless red patch on the crown of their head, a black mustache-like mask on their cheeks, a bright yellow eye, and a grayish yellow beak. Another important note about this whooping crane is actually the habitat that they're in. So while sandhill cranes are a bird that you might see in your backyard in parks and prairies pretty easily, whooping cranes really aren't that kind of bird. With a bright white plumage like that, it's incredibly important that they find a way to stay safe from predators, knowing that they aren't able to easily camouflage. And one way that whooping cranes do that is by spending their time in deeper water or spending a more significant portion of their time in wetlands. So when looking for whooping cranes, it's much easier to spot them in wetlands than it is to spot them in parks or prairies like you might find some of those sandhill cranes. Whooping cranes are also very unique when they're in flight because you'll see they fly with that long neck outstretched in front of them, those long black legs trailing behind them. They have an impressive seven to eight foot wingspan. And at the very tips of their wings, you'll see these prominent black wing tips. And that's incredibly advantageous for a large white bird like a whooping crane. When they're undergoing their migration and flying long distances, the feathers that are most likely to undergo wear and tear and break are gonna be those at the very tips of your wings. And if they're white, they're not very strong feathers. So for a large white bird to have these darker feathers at the tips of their wings, those feathers are going to have more melanin, they're gonna be stronger and they're gonna be less likely to break, which is great for them on their long migration across North America. All right, so now that we've familiarized ourselves with what these birds look like, I do want to dive into their history, starting first, of course, with our sandhill crane, which I like to call a conservation success story. So in the 1940s, sandhill cranes were almost completely extirpated to the east of the Mississippi River, so much so that this scene that we see in front of us, a marsh without cranes in it, unfortunately became common. And at this time, Aldo Leopold believed that cranes could be completely lost from the Midwest altogether, as he wrote here in Marshland Elegy saying, the sadness discernible in some marshes arises perhaps from their once having harbored cranes. Now they stand humbled adrift in history. Unfortunately, sandhill cranes were quickly removed from the Midwestern landscape, ultimately due to unregulated hunting and habitat loss. And this had a pretty massive impact on sandhill cranes simply because of their life history. So when talking about the life history of sandhill cranes, it's important to note that this doesn't apply only to sandhill cranes, but it applies to all 15 species of cranes. And like I said before, 10 out of the 15 are listed as threatened or endangered. So the first thing to know about sandhill cranes or cranes in general is that they're very long lived. Our sandhill cranes have been documented living into their 30s in the wild and in captivity, they can live to be much older. At the International Crane Foundation, we once cared for a Siberian crane named Wolf and he lived to be 83 years old. So on top of being a very long lived species, they're also very slow to reproduce. They're typically only going to lay about one to two eggs each year. They'll sit on those eggs for about 30 days and oftentimes they'll hatch just one chick called a colt. Sometimes if there's a lot of food resources, they'll hatch two, but typically it's going to be just that one colt. They're then going to raise that colt throughout the entire summer. It takes around 80 days for them to fledge or be able to fly. They'll then fly down with them on their fall migration, spend all winter with their chick, come right back with them in their spring migration, at which point that chick is then going to break off from their parents, join a non-breeding flock until they're about three to five years old. Then they'll eventually find their own mate that they'll presumably mate with for life and cycle right back into this slow reproduction of laying one to two eggs each year, hatch one chick, and that chick not breeding until it's about three to five years old. So animals with these sorts of life history characteristics being long-lived, slow to reproduce, and laying very small clutches are often greatly affected by losses to their population because it's very hard for them to rebuild after they sustain those losses. But I did say that sandhill cranes are a conservation success story, and you may be wondering where they are now. 
And fortunately for sandhill cranes, they're found really across the majority of North America. You can see that there's about an estimated, again, 800,000 sandhill cranes in the world. In Illinois, you can expect to see around 40 to 50,000 sandhill cranes every year. And that's part of that eastern flock that flies through the eastern United States that carries around 100,000 sandhill cranes. So that's a pretty significant population size. We can also see that there are six subspecies of sandhill cranes presently in the landscape. Three of them are migratory, our lesser, our Canadian, and our greater. In Illinois, you're only going to see the greater sandhill crane. There are also three non-migratory populations, the Cuban, the Florida, and the Mississippi. So while as a species, sandhill cranes are not federally listed and they are considered to be relatively common, that doesn't mean that all populations of sandhill cranes are stable. We know that the Cuban and the Mississippi sandhill crane are listed as endangered, and some of our crane partners in the South are doing a reintroduction program with the Mississippi sandhill cranes that's incredibly similar to some of the work that we're doing with whooping cranes here in the Midwest, which I'll touch on just a little bit later. Let's focus in on these Illinois sandhill cranes. And I want to show you some of the spaces that these birds are spending their time in throughout the year, just moving month by month. And what we're looking at right here is a migration map and looking at concentrations of birds. So areas that are orange is where we're seeing larger concentrations of sandhill cranes throughout the year. Where it's blue, these are kind of smaller concentrations. And white, this is where we don't have large numbers. But that's not saying that there aren't any sandhill cranes in those spaces. So focusing here on January, you'll see right away that some of those sandhill cranes are spending their winters relatively far north uh, for what we would expect a bird to be staying. You can see some of them aren't even leaving Wisconsin, and we do have a lot that are spending their time around Rockford or even the Chicagoland area. When we move into February, which I think of as a very cold time of year, you'll see that sandhill cranes have decided at this time that that is early enough for them to start their spring migration. Many of them had spent their winter in western Indiana. They're going to head straight north up into Lake Michigan and then cut over and then start heading northwest, which is when they're going to be cutting through Chicago and the Rockford area as they're making their way back into Wisconsin. And you'll see that the bulk of that migratory movement is going to be continuing into March. And when our sandhill cranes are migrating, they're flying only during the day. And when they're flying during the day, they can cover around 200 miles each day. And they do that by using thermals, which are these circulating warm updrafts of air, which help the sandhill cranes to stay in the air and moving forwards while expending less energy. As we make our way into April, this is really when our sandhill cranes are starting to get into the flow of the breeding season. And we're seeing that a lot of them have dispersed from Northern Illinois, have moved further into Wisconsin, and they're starting to break apart from these large flocks. So they're becoming more territorial and they're establishing where they're going to be building their nest and raising their chick. So as we move through the next few months, you'll see that there's really not much change. We do have sandhill cranes breeding in Northern Illinois. We have most of them are breeding in Wisconsin. Again, we can expect that to move further south as the years go on. But there's not much movement during this time. That's because when our sandhill cranes are nesting, they're sitting for 30 days, then they're raising a chick who's flightless for 80 days. They're really going to be kind of sedentary and in one spot for the majority of the summer. Once we move into September, this is when we're really starting to see the beginning of that migration movement in the fall. We're seeing those large flocks form. They're starting to stage. They're spending their time in uh, in prairies and farm fields and spaces where they can find ample food resources to fuel up for that migration. And then you'll see coming through your area that that migratory movement starts to pick up in October. And then the bulk of it you're going to see in November. Moving into December, you'll see that there are still some stragglers coming through. And if you look just a little bit east, again, those birds are going to be returning largely to Indiana to be spending their winters there, or they'll stay again around the Chicagoland area, just along that shore of Lake Michigan that we're seeing there. So in Illinois, we're seeing that sandhill cranes are predominantly found on two landscapes. We're seeing them in wetlands and we're seeing them in agricultural fields. And they're using both of these spaces because they provide them with ample access to food resources, they provide them with water, and they're both relatively flat landscapes. So in wetlands, we'll see that sandhill cranes are going to be eating things like crayfish, fish, frogs, snakes, roots, tubers, berries, really anything that they can get their beak on. And in agricultural fields, we'll see that they'll be eating things like invertebrates, small rodents, and waste grains. But in addition to these two landscape types, 
We're seeing that sandhill cranes are also venturing into towns. They're venturing into parks and prairies, especially in northern Illinois, where we're seeing more suburbs. A lot of those sandhill cranes are depending on those, those suburban spaces as well. And this is where they can find food resources such as bird seeds or even the chips that we see these sandhill cranes eating in this photo here in this park. So this rebound of sandhill cranes that we've seen is really due in part to their adaptability to a human dominated landscape. We know historically Illinois would have looked very different than it does today. We would have seen a state filled with fertile prairies and wetlands that would have been incredibly hospitable to those cranes. However, since the 1800s, you know that Illinois has lost over 90% of its historic wetland acreage. When you take a peek at some of the states surrounding Illinois, places that our sandhill cranes depend on, like Wisconsin, Indiana, Michigan, uh, Minnesota, and Iowa, we're seeing that they've been similarly impacted as well. As we know, our sandhill crane populations did decline drastically by the 1940s, but their populations have since regrown to astounding levels as they've become adapted to using those agricultural landscapes, those parks, those prairies, those wetlands, the spaces that are available to them. That being said, we do know that sandhill cranes are threatened by continued urban expansion and land conversion to agriculture because despite being able to use these spaces during the day to forage and find food, sandhill cranes are always going to be dependent on wetland areas for nesting and for roosting at night, as this provides them with uh, safety from the predators that they might face out in the landscape as well. In addition to this adaptability to human landscapes providing uh, space for our sandhill cranes use while also providing threats, we're knowing that it doesn't come without its consequences for people as well. So with the rebound of sandhill cranes and their increasing use of some of these human dominated spaces, we are also now seeing an increase in human wildlife conflicts with sandhill cranes. And some of the major conflicts that we deal with at the International Crane Foundation are things like crop depredation. This is largely happening north of you in Wisconsin, where when they cross the border, they're landing in spaces that are uh, largely agricultural. We're also seeing that there are issues with collisions. As you can see from this picture right here, when sandhill cranes are in very suburban areas and they have their chicks with them, they can be crossing roads. Those birds are flightless for a very large portion of time. And if you're setting out bird seed for them or other food resources for them, this is also encouraging them to stay in these areas and continue to cross the roads with those flightless chicks as well. And another issue that we are seeing is the issue of property damage. Again, in those areas where sandhill cranes are breeding, where they're feeling territorial, where they might attack their own reflection if they do see it in those areas. And this is incredibly concerning for the future of sandhill cranes. So the International Crane Foundation has been working to manage these issues and find long-term solutions such as encouraging communities to not feed cranes, which is again, driving them to cross the street. We also suggest covering reflective surfaces if you find that there are aggressive sandhill cranes in your neighborhood. So if you can park your car in a garage, cover it with a tarp, something where the sandhill crane will be encouraged to move on and not stay and be very territorial in those spaces. And then we also in uh, Wisconsin helped to develop a bird repellent seed treatment to combat that issue of crop depredation. Alrighty, so I do want to shift gears and talk a little bit more about the whooping crane, which is a very different story than the story I just shared with you about the sandhill crane. And I like to call the whooping crane a story of perseverance, cooperation, and creativity, as this is a conservation effort that is still being played out on our landscape. And pictured here, we have the historic range of the whooping crane. So what we're looking at here is pre-European expansion. And we're seeing that whooping cranes would have had a pretty significant range. They would have been breeding as far north as the Arctic, coming in through the upper Midwest. And right where you're located in Illinois, you would have expected historically to see breeding whooping cranes. Then would have migrated through the bulk of the United States to then spend their winters in places like central Mexico or coastal Gulf of Mexico. At this time, it was predicted that there were over 10,000 whooping cranes in the fertile wetlands and prairies of North America. And that really tells us two things right away. The first thing being that 10,000 whooping cranes across North America is incredibly different than our current estimates of 800,000 sandhill cranes. So that's telling us right away that whooping cranes were never one of the most numerous species out on the landscape. They are far more territorial than sandhill cranes and maintain larger territories. They need much more space than those birds are, but these numbers aren't very large to begin with. But we also know that by the 1940s, Whooping cranes faced near extinction when there were only 20 individuals left out in the wild. 
And you may be wondering what contributed to this decline of whooping cranes. And unfortunately, there were many factors at play, some of which you saw with our sandhill cranes. So things like unregulated hunting. When European settlers moved into these spaces that our whooping cranes were using, these uh, fertile wetlands, these areas were lush with resources. But unfortunately, at this time, game laws are mostly ignored and they're rarely enforced. And this really led to unrestrained hunting and destruction of wild areas that ultimately grew into the 1800s and led to the extinction of some species that we could have seen today, species like the passenger pigeon and a near extinction of others. So birds like the whooping crane. And unfortunately, as whooping cranes became scarce on the landscape as a result of this unregulated hunting, we're seeing an increase in their value, which is encouraging people to continue to hunt whooping cranes, but now continue to find anything that they can sort of monetize from these whooping cranes. So pulling eggs off of their nests simply for the value of having them, or even creating a trade for the feathers of whooping cranes. So the millinery trade or the trade for wild bird feathers, unfortunately was driven by bird feathers being used to adorn women's hats for fashion. And some of the most sought after bird feathers were those of very large white birds like our whooping crane that could make impressive white plumes like the one that's pictured right here. Fortunately for whooping cranes and the many birds we continue to see today, some high society women from Boston, they actually noticed this issue very early on and formed the first Audubon Society, the Massachusetts Audubon Society, and it banned the trade of wild bird feathers. Finally, another massive contributor to the decline of whooping cranes was habitat loss, which was largely driven by the Homestead Act of the 1860s. And this act essentially encouraged people to rapidly move out west, and in doing so, convert hundreds of thousands of acres of that wetland habitat that our whooping cranes depended on into predominantly agricultural land, which took away a valuable resource for our whooping cranes and many other wetland species. And when people began to notice not only the decline of whooping cranes, but the loss of some common birds in wild spaces, it resulted in a series of laws to protect those spaces and those species, some of which you might be quite familiar with. So things like the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, which prohibit the illegal take. So taking their eggs, their feathers, their nests, the birds themselves, some of those big things that impacted our whooping cranes early on. We then see the passage of the Duck Stamp Act, which is a federal uh, art competition used to design a waterfall themed stamp, which is then sold to hunters to hunt on federal lands. And that money is recirculated right back into wetland conservation. The duck stamp still exists today and has raised over $850 million to protect 6.5 million acres of wildlife habitat. So it is incredibly significant in protecting those spaces that our whooping cranes depend on. We then see in 1966, the creation of the refuge system. This is an incredibly important piece in the puzzle for protecting whooping cranes. The reason being that whooping cranes are very wetland dependent and they maintain large territories. So that adaptability that we saw in our sandhill cranes that helped them to sort of rebuild without any sort of reintroduction program or uh, large amounts of intervention from scientists, we're not going to see that with our whooping cranes. They're not nearly as adaptable and they need those large wetland areas. So when the refuge system was created in 1966, this was something that set aside large wetland tracts that our whooping cranes could depend on. And if you pay attention to the spaces where whooping cranes are stopping over on their migration, where they're breeding, where they're wintering, many of them are using the refuge system and depending on that space. We then see in 1972, the creation of the Clean Water Act, protecting those wetland habitats that our whooping cranes depend on. And finally, in 1973, the passage of the Endangered Species Act. At this time in 1973, there were 70 whooping cranes living out in the wild and they were immediately listed as endangered and they continue to be listed as endangered today. And today whooping cranes exist across four distinct populations. The first of which is the remnant of that historic population. So the one that used to cover the majority of North America has since been reduced to a single flyway. And these birds will spend their summers up at Wood Buffalo National Park in Canada migrate through the Central Flyway, and then they'll spend their winters at Aransas National Wildlife Refuge in coastal Texas. In the 1990s, the International Crane Foundation and Crane Conservation Partners worked to reintroduce the first non-migratory population of whooping cranes in Florida. And in 2011, we reintroduced a second one in Louisiana. Sandwiched between those two in 2001 is when the Eastern Migratory Population, or the EMP, a second migratory population was reintroduced in the United States. And that's the one that we're gonna focus on today is those are the whooping cranes that you can see in Illinois. And I have it circled right there. 
And I want to share with you a little bit about the eastern migratory population, uh, primarily how the eastern migratory population came to be, the role that the International Crane Foundation played in it. But I do want to preface this by saying that these steps that I'm going to share with you about the internet or about the uh, eastern migratory population and whooping crane reintroductions, these aren't a relic of the past. This is work that we continue to do, we're continuing to do even up to this year, because the eastern migratory population is not self-sustaining. So if we don't continue to put birds out into the population and have a pretty heavy hand in their management and monitoring for the coming years, this population's numbers will drop and we might see that we don't have whooping cranes in the eastern United States uh, if we don't continue to do the work that we're doing. So I do want to break this down into some uh, pretty simple steps for how we're able to get whooping cranes out into the eastern United States and how we are helping this population grow to eventually one day become self-sustaining. So the first step in any reintroduction is, of course, getting birds you're able to release out into the wild. And we ultimately do that by uh, breeding our birds that live at the International Crane Foundation. So you can see that here we have uh, two staff that are working on breeding a whooping crane there. We're also able to get eggs off of wild nests. We do something called double clutching, where we go out into the wetlands, we pull eggs off of the first clutch, bring them into captivity to hatch those chicks, and the wild birds are able to lay another clutch just a little bit later in the season. And in this way, we can get double the amount of chicks each year to help this population grow much quicker than it naturally would. So once we have these eggs, either from our wild birds or from our captive birds, we're able to incubate them for around 30 days at which point we hatch a chick. And now it's time for us to raise these chicks to be released out into the wild. And there are many different ways to raise uh, whooping crane chicks. We rely on two methods. The first of which is probably the most natural, the most obvious. This is called parent rearing. And this is where we use adult whooping cranes that live at the International Crane Foundation. They hatch the chick, they raise the chick, teach them everything they need to know about how to survive in the wild. And eventually the bird is released out into the wild. But through our breeding of whooping cranes and collecting those eggs, you can start to see how we might have a lot of eggs each year and we might not have enough adults that are able to raise those chicks every single year. And this is where we rely on a second method known as costume rearing to raise the rest of those whooping crane chicks. And pictured here is the costume that is used for costume rearing. And we absolutely know that it looks ridiculous at first glance, we are aware of that, uh, but it does serve an incredibly important role. The role being that it teaches whooping cranes their own identity so that they can make safe and smart choices out in the wild. So young whooping cranes, like many other water birds, they imprint. They look at, the, uh, they look at who is raising them and they decide that that is their own identity. So if I were to raise a whooping crane, looking, sounding, acting, talking like a human being, that whooping crane isn't going to understand that it is a whooping crane. It's not gonna make smart choices out in the wild. It might try to associate with people. And when it comes time to breed, it's not going to seek out other whooping cranes on the landscape to breed with. So in order for this population to grow and be successful, every single whooping crane needs to know that they're a whooping crane. And when you break down the anatomy of these costumes, you can start to see how it looks like a whooping crane. We have an adult biologist wearing the costume, so that gives you kind of the height of the whooping crane. They're covered entirely in white, which gives you that large white body. Their left arm is going to act as their wing. It'll be tucked in most of the time, but if they want to flap their wings and teach the young birds how to fly, they can pop their arm out and you'll see those prominent black wing tips. And then their right arm is going to act as sort of the long neck of the whooping crane. And at the very top, they have a puppet head that has all of those distinct facial features of adult whooping cranes. Wearing this costume, however, is not enough. The biologists who wear these costumes, they also need to act like whooping cranes. So they spend a lot of time mimicking whooping crane behaviors, doing things like foraging on the ground, preening their feathers, feeding their chicks, standing alert, sometimes even again, flapping their wings and pretending to fly. And then finally, they need to sound like a whooping crane. So when they're wearing these costumes, they're not speaking at all, but instead they have a tape recorder in their pocket to broadcast a soft contact call. And this is a sound that you're not likely to hear out in the wild, but it's a sound that whooping crane adults will make when they're trying to talk to their chick. And it's supposed to be sort of a comforting sound. And if you listen really closely, it sounds kind of like a purr. And I'll play that call now. So once we raise these whooping cranes, either using, again, adult whooping cranes or using costumed biologists to raise them, it's in time for these birds to be released out into the wild. 
And there are many different ways that you can release a whooping crane out into the wild, but the one that we have pictured here is known as a soft release. So essentially we build a temporary pen in the wild wetland that we want these whooping cranes to live in. They're given time to acclimate in that pen to being in the wild. The pen is slowly taken apart until these birds are completely out in the wild. So you can start to see how this entire process from start to finish is incredibly time consuming, even just for one individual whooping crane, but it's also incredibly expensive as well. The cost of hatching, raising, releasing, and monitoring just one whooping crane out in the wild in the eastern migratory population is about $100,000 per crane. So it is incredibly expensive, it is very time consuming, but it is necessary to save this endangered species from the brink of extinction, and it's work that we're again continuing to do. So this year we are planning to release nine whooping cranes. We released our first whooping crane into the population just this week, and this is going to be our largest release effort since 2017. So we are starting to ramp up some of the work that we're doing after the COVID pandemic to get more birds back out on the landscape and help this population grow very quickly again. And once these birds are out on the landscape, it is important that we continue to monitor this wild population. So all of our birds that re are released into the eastern migratory population, they're given a unique combination of colorful leg bands, and it'll be some combination of white, green, red, and black on one or both legs. And then many of them are also given a radio tag on their leg, which if you look at this picture on the left, is that sort of stick-like thing that's hanging off of that bird's leg right there. And this radio tag allows our team of scientists to track the birds as they move along their migration route. So again, this team of scientists, as well as volunteers along the flyway, they track our birds and they use this information to further research and knowledge about whooping cranes, such as understanding the habitats that they're using, uh, the migratory pathways that they're making, their breeding success, their survival, the individuals they're associating with. And as this population grows, we're getting a better understanding of the spaces that they're going to be moving into as some of them establish large territories and others are forced to look for different areas to live. So this population is relatively young, just started in 2001. So it's incredibly important that we continue to get very consistent long-term data on this population to know what their long-term success or survival is going to look like. So on top of all of the work that our team and our volunteers are doing, we also rely very heavily on reported sightings from the public or from citizen scientists along the Whooping Cranes Flyway. So we ask that if you see a whooping crane in Illinois, look for those colorful bands on their legs We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to see where the birds are at. So the first step to, to reporting a banded whooping crane is, of course, confirming that you saw a whooping crane. So you can use some of those tips, tricks, and pointers that I talked about at the beginning. Large white bird, red on their head, black on their cheeks, black on their wingtips. Are they associating with a wetland? Did you hear them calling overhead? All of that is incredibly helpful in confirming your ID. Next, you can see if there are whooping crane sightings reported in your area. You can do that by heading to our website, Whooper Map. Stephanie, yes, um, we're uh, our battery ran out on our on our other projector. So uh, could you hold on a second? <laughs> yep, absolutely. This is ours. Is that their computer? And she's not here. It's ours. Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah.
that person is not there. I don't think we can get it. Done. I, I don't think it will. Well, that's the thing that they there's nothing here. Well, this is this is not hard. We just put it No, but that won't. If that won't, will that plug in? We can just run it off of here. I don't want to plug into this. I don't have right. HDMI on this computer. Okay. Technology. We can um, we can run the audio uh, of you speaking, Stephanie, and. Um, People should be able to hear you, but uh, they won't be able to see your slides. So okay. you want to do that? Yeah, I just have a few slides left, so I'll do my best to uh, describe what I'm seeing. Hey there. <laughs> All right, go ahead. All righty, so uh, reporting your sighting of a banded whooping crane. So the next step would be heading to our website where it is whoopermap.savingcranes.org. And I can of course send these links to you later as well. Um, and this is where you can see the counties that whooping crane sightings have recently been reported in. You'll see that the International Crane Foundation only reports out counties. So we do ask that if you wanna share whooping crane sightings with friends, family, or on social media, don't share any information more specific than the county that you see them in. They are an endangered species. They are very sensitive to disturbances. So we do wanna keep these birds safe from any sort of disturbance. And we don't wanna be encouraging people to uh, flock out per se, to come and see these birds. You can then report your sighting to the International Crane Foundation by going to bandedcranes.org. And this is where you can share with us and our team of scientists, the exact location that you saw these birds. If you have pictures, if you were able to read leg bands, if you were able to observe any sort of unique behaviors, any information that you think might be valuable for us to have about your whooping crane sighting, you can report to us there. And from citizen science reportings, we've really learned a lot about whooping cranes, including that they have decided that they're going to shorten their migration route. So one fact that I held from you about the Eastern migratory population is that when we created this population, we didn't just drop the birds in Wisconsin and they immediately knew how to fly all the way down to Florida. We actually taught them that route by using an ultralight airplane, which is kind of like a kite with a large fan on it. And we taught those birds to fly all the way from Wisconsin down to Florida and make these nice stops at wetlands that, that we knew would be good spaces for them to use on their migration. However, after we stopped that program, we started to see that many of those whooping cranes were actually cutting their migration short. They found out that they didn't need to expend that much energy to go further south, to go all the way down into Florida. And many of them are spending their winters in those same spaces that we saw as sandhill cranes. We're seeing a lot of them spend their winters in places like Western Indiana, and increasingly we're seeing them move over into uh, Southeastern Illinois as well. And I have on here some maps that we put out once a month. Uh, it is our Whooping Crane Eastern Population Update. This is all publicly accessible on our website. You can also uh, get email updates about the spaces where whooping cranes have been spotted month by month. But a lot of these sightings that we're seeing, a lot of these reports, especially on their migration and their wintering areas, are reports that we're getting from citizen scientists. 
And in 2016, we received a very cool citizen science recording of cranes spotted in Illinois from a Sam Burkhart. And you have a picture of some cranes that are flying right over downtown Chicago. He observed around 30,000 sandhill cranes flying over Chicago. And within that group, when he zoomed in, he spotted that there were four whooping cranes that were flying in that group as well. And if you look closely at them, you can see that two of them are adults and two of them are juveniles. So that's an incredibly cool citizen science reporting that was shared with us, not something that we would have known about without Sam Burkhart sharing that uh, observation with us of that migratory movement through downtown Chicago. So we're incredibly grateful for that. So today across all of the wild and captive flocks of whooping cranes, we know that there are about 800 birds. If you focus just on the wild flocks, we're looking at about 650 birds. And if you focus right in on that Eastern population that comes through Illinois each year, we're looking at about 76 whooping cranes. So in about 70 years, we've seen a pretty significant recovery of this species. And this story is really proof that by working together, scientists, governments, and communities can really save a species from the brink of extinction. That being said, our work is not done. Whooping cranes are continuing to face threats across their entire flyway, especially right here um, in the northern part of their flyway where we're looking at Wisconsin, Illinois, and Indiana. And this is where they're facing those continued threats of habitat loss. They're facing threats of power line collisions, as we're seeing most of the whooping cranes moving from Wisconsin into Indiana, crossing through Illinois. But we're also seeing in these spaces that whooping cranes are facing the threat of poaching, so the illegal take of these whooping cranes. And as an organization that is committed to protecting whooping cranes and safeguarding their future, there's a few things that we wanted to understand about poaching. Those being, where is it happening? Who is causing it? And what can we do to stop it? So the first question is, where is it happening? And ultimately, when we ran a study of all of the poaching cases that we knew about in all whooping crane populations, we found that the large majority of whooping crane poachings were occurring within our reintroduced populations. So that's Florida, Louisiana, and our eastern migratory population. And when we really dove into those two, we're seeing them mostly in our eastern population and our Louisiana population. So the largest increase in poaching incidents occurred between 2010 and 2019. Next question then becomes, who is causing this? And what we found is that in the large majority of these poaching incidents, they were largely unrelated to hunters or cases of mistaken identification. And the few that are, we're seeing that those are hunters that decided to hunt before legal hunting hours when identification is difficult. And you can then say that person has now decided to identify as a poacher, not a hunter, because a poacher is somebody who knowingly disregards hunting regulations. So unfortunately, the picture that I have shown here does represent a typical situation in which a whooping crane shooting might occur. And these birds that I have pictured are two individuals that are standing in an agricultural field. They have stopped over on their migration or they might be foraging on their wintering grounds, which is largely the time when we see them in those agricultural fields. They are highly visible. You can see them from the roadside. And more often than that, these shootings are occurring on private property and from the roadside, sometimes even with a person shooting from inside of the car using a high-powered rifle. This entire act is highly illegal, and the person who has committed this act is considered to be a vandal, not a hunter who made an honest mistake. And one of the poaching incidents that we know about was committed by a man named Jeff G. Blatchford. He was a 25-year-old man in South Dakota, and in 2012, he shot an adult male whooping crane and a hawk. And when asked about shooting these uh, birds, he said he did this sort of thing all the time. He admitted to shooting hawks off of power lines and shooting ducks in ditches, but then he said, I have never shot an eagle. And that's an incredibly interesting response because nobody had asked him if he had shot an eagle, but he wanted to make sure we knew that wasn't something he would do. And that really tells us two things right away. The first thing being that he He's aware of the pride his community and his country has with eagles. And the second, he may be aware that you can get into a lot of trouble for shooting eagles, considering the protections that are in place for them. So this pride and this awareness of penalties that exist for eagles and really aids in their protection long term does not necessarily exist for whooping cranes today, but could be pivotal to their protection. So we've been addressing this pride and this awareness for whooping cranes, ultimately through community outreach programs with K through 12 students, unfortunately, the average age of a whooping crane poacher is just 26 years old. 
We've also been working very closely with outdoor recreationists, birders, hunters, and more across the Whooping Crane Flyway since 2015. And the picture that I have pulled up here is a map of the states where whooping cranes have been found in, and they also have the poaching incidents recorded. And we have those before 2015 versus those after 2015. And you can see a very significant difference in the number before versus the number after. So we've been working with these communities in these spaces to share with them the story of whooping cranes, the threats that they face, and ask them to be advocates for whooping cranes by spreading our message and inspiring others to care for whooping cranes and be our eyes and ears on the ground for reporting poaching or harassment of whooping cranes. So since 2015, where we've been focusing a lot of our outreach efforts in those spaces whooping cranes are found in Wisconsin, Indiana, and Alabama, so largely breeding and wintering areas, we've seen that whooping crane poaching has dropped from causing 16% of adult mortalities to around 10.5%, and our goal is to completely eradicate whooping crane poaching as a cause of mortality. That being said, we also need to start changing our approach a little bit. We're seeing with our eastern migratory population of whooping cranes, many of them are flying through Illinois, and historically we haven't spent a lot of time with our outreach efforts in Illinois along the migratory pathway. We're also seeing again on that, uh, that eastern edge that some of those birds are jumping over into those spaces to spend their winters in Illinois, and a lot of them are choosing to spend their time on private property when they're in Illinois. So some of the work that we're doing in the coming years is spending a lot more time in Illinois to connect this migratory pathway of whooping cranes, work with the communities that may encounter whooping cranes, working again with those naturalists, those people who are outdoors, people such as yourselves that are more unlikely to encounter or see a whooping crane and can act as our eyes and ears on the ground for protecting them. So following all of this, you may be wondering, well, what can I do to help cranes? And fortunately, there are many things that you can do. The first thing being, know how to identify cranes and safely look for them on the landscape. So knowing the differences between our sandhill cranes and our whooping cranes, and remembering them to give, or remembering to give them their space when you're, you're looking for them out in the wild. So with our whooping cranes, because they are endangered and again very sensitive to dis disturbance, we ask that you stay at least 200 yards. That's going to be two football fields away from them at all times. Don't share where you see these birds on social media with any information more specific than the county. Remember to respect private property, only park in designated parking areas, report banded cranes to the International Crane Foundation, and report all whooping crane harassment, disturbance, or poaching to local authorities. You can also talk to your friends and legislators about cranes and wetlands in your state in ways that they can protect both the species and the spaces that they're depending on as they're breeding in northern Illinois, migrating through, and then sometimes wintering now in eastern Illinois as well. You can also protect some of your local wetlands. While some of those smaller wetlands in northern Illinois may not be as important for our whooping cranes, they may depend on those larger wetland areas. Even small wetlands on your own property can be incredibly beneficial for sandhill cranes, especially as they're again breeding in that northern Illinois area. You can also head to our website, savingcranes.org, to learn a little bit more about some of the work that our organization is doing, opportunities to get involved, some of the volunteer opportunities or citizen science opportunities like our annual Midwest Crane Count in the spring, uh, ways that you can get involved in some of the work we do. And you can also sign our pledge to protect whooping cranes. All righty. So that is everything that I have for you today. I do want to thank you guys for having me here to talk about whooping cranes and sandhill cranes in Illinois. And I do want to open it up to any questions that you might have for me. So if you have a question online, unmute yourself and just ask your question. Uh, if you're here in the room, you just need to yell at the computer. Any questions? I have a question. Stephanie, this is Janet. Um, what are the cranes eating in the winter when the landscape is frozen? You know what? We're on note and mute. Can you hear me, Stephanie? Oh, here we go. Stephanie, can you hear us? Yes, absolutely. This is Janet again. My question was, what are the cranes eating in the winter when the landscape is so frozen? Yeah, so our cranes are going to be eating um, a lot of things that they can find. And again, those agricultural fields in the winter. So eating those waste grains, they can eat small rodents. And then when they are spending their time, even in Wisconsin, Northern Illinois, or Indiana, they're very smart about picking areas where the water is not frozen. So sometimes that means 
uh, a little bit of a strange wintering area, like spending time in large pools outside of uh, where electric companies might be working where they can be cooling off their equipment and we find that things don't freeze so they're continuing okay <laughs> more somebody's freezing up lost her hair. we lost you <laughs> Make a chat. This is why we're looking for somebody to help with our Zoom programs because we're every month we seem to be struggling with one thing or another. Um, oh, there we go. It looks like I just came back, but were you able to uh, hear the rest of my? Uh, response to what cranes are eating in the winter or did it cut off before I got yeah. to it? Yeah, we got that. Okay, perfect. Is there anybody else um, online that wants to ask a question? Do so through chat or turn off your microphone or turn on your microphone. No, nope. I think that's it. Any other questions in the audience? Oh, we're all silent. All right, Stephanie. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Of course. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Yeah. All right. We're going to stop the recording now. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, pick up your results. Look at the library. We have about 20 minutes that we have some snacks and have a snack. <laughs> also, I forgot to mention uh, one of our members gave us a whole bunch of uh, pods of Kentucky coffee tree with the seeds in them. Oh. If you're willing to try to grow them, they are really hard to grow from seed. Um,